Aloha, it's Robert Stelic. Welcome to the Blue Planet Show, where I interview wingfoil athletes, designers, and thought leaders right here from my home office in the garage. We talk about wingfoil technique and equipment, and I'm also trying to get to know my guests, their background, what inspires them, and how they live each day to the fullest. You can watch these long interviews on YouTube or listen to them as a podcast on the go. Just search for the Blue Planet Show on your favorite podcast app. This show is made for those of you who are as crazy about wing foiling as I am. I'm not rushing through these interviews. This is kind of like the opposite of a 30 second Instagram video. They're super long interviews and I know they're not for everyone. And really I'm just making these for the 5% of you that actually watch the whole thing. So I hope you're one of those elite people at the very top, the 5 percenters and that you're gonna watch the whole thing. Today's interview is with Kane DeWild. He is an amazing young athlete. And before I talked to Kane, I didn't realize how involved he is in the design aspect of the sport. Uh, foil design, board design, and also developing and R&Ding wings. So he has some really in-depth knowledge probably more than anyone I've talked to so far. And that's why this interview goes pretty long, but I think you'll find every minute of it is very interesting and I could have actually kept going for a lot longer. So without further ado, here is Kane DeWild. All right, Kane, welcome to the Blue Planet Show. It's great to have you here. Um, so to get started, maybe just tell us a little bit about your background, you know, start from the very beginning. Where did you grow up and, um, Tell us about your early childhood memories that kind of got you into, into water sports and so on. Yeah. Hi, Robert. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, it's, it's, it's super cool that, that you're, uh, that you're hosting something like this and, uh, I love listening to them. So, so it's going to be fun. Thanks. Um, I kind of started the whole journey, uh, probably in middle school, getting into sailing, super into surfing, skimboarding, um, and through sailing, I kind of, uh, or I, it was dinghy racing, actually. Um, I, as a natural, like evolution of, of dinghy racing, you, I wanted to learn how everything works and, and how to improve and um, how I could tune my sail better and shift my weight in the boat better to, to go, to get, to get a slight edge. And so I started researching, you know, how boats work, how, how sails work, how your, your rudder and daggerboard work. And that's kind of what started it. Um, after that, so, so sorry, but, uh, you were born and raised on Maui or yeah, born and raised, born and raised on Maui. I grew up up country, um, okay. and lifetime surfer. Okay. Cool. Um, and how old are you now? I am now 20, just turned 20. Okay. And, um, and can you also tell us your weight that people always ask about that right away? Yeah, I'm, I'm six, six Oh, and, and 195 pounds. Okay. Uh, that's very similar to me. So early on you started dinghy racing and then, um, I think glider planes. Yeah. So it's dinghy, dinghy racing is so much fun and it's, it's such a deep sport. Um, there it, it, it's crazy how the tiniest little sail tuning or, or tiniest little thing can give you such an edge. Um, that's in Hawaii on Oahu, uh, oh, yeah. nuking day in an open dick. Um, I remember marine. being terrified to go out that day. <laughs> um, and my, my coaches, Kea, uh, Kea and Ian were like, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go. And eventually push me enough to, to get in the water. And that's probably un until then my, my best session ever. So th that one with the boat on the right, this one, uh, me, me glossing. I actually have that right here. This is the first thing I ever 3D modeled. In, okay, let me uh, go, go back CAD. to that. Oh, cool. All right. And it's the first thing I ever glass. Um, and it, 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 it's kind of what set me on this, on this track, really. Um, so that's uh, like a it, model of a, um, like a displacement dinghy sailboat? Is that what it's? More, of a, more of a planing hull. Um, oh, but planing I, hull, I, yeah. I, made, I made three different variations of these. And took them to a river and, and tested the resistance with a, with little scale, um, and, and that was my project for eight, my big project for eighth grade. Um, so how did actually, you, how did you test it in the river? I took it to a, a river with really consistent swing flow, and oh, there might be a little hole. There's a little hole on the front here. 
Okay. If you can see, yeah, it. see it, tied a rope through it, put a gram hook, hooked it to like a gram fishing scale, a really finely fine uh, fishing scale, and just let it sit and took an average over over a few minutes. Nice. And then did you t test some variations of it or? Yeah. So I had three variations. I don't know where the other ones are right now, but um, I, I just, just changes in the outline or, or the rocker slight changes in the, in the bottom um, just to see what kind of effect they have. Wow. That's amazing. And how old were you when you were working on that? Ooh, eighth grade. So eighth grade, not really sure. <laughs> Pretty young. It looks like you were a little bit more, a uh, little bit chubby before you got tall and lanky. I was, <laughs> I was foiling, <laughs> foiling magic, isn't it? Yeah, I know. It's like a lot of people um, look a lot skinnier after they started foiling. Yeah. Oh, look. So that that's before I was into kite foiling too. Um, I before I, I I ever did it, but uh, I made I made little model foils, um, and, and took them in the river too. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, super fun. Well, what is this? <laughs> um, so we have a forklift, and when my <laughs> when my friend Vatia came over from Hood River, from Vatia Borsma, an awesome kiter, uh, we hooked up a bar to the forklift over the trampoline, and, and we're uh, we're practicing our our moves. It's pretty fun. <laughs> that's that's pretty rad. Yeah. See. Okay. And these posts aren't super old because I actually started to kind of have a, a college thing. Like if I could document all these different things to eventually show to a college when I wanted to get them to school. And it, it sort of just evolved from there. Yeah. So you did like glider planes, looks like. Yeah. Glider planes, kiting, what a, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Broke my rudder. Go cards. All right. So, and and I met you a couple of years ago. You came over to Oahu and you did that um, pumping contest where it, it, the point was to catch a hundred waves with your team. And I yeah. was sitting. I was sitting in the channel at Queens, um, watching. You were in the heat be before us, and you were just going round and round, pumping back out, catching <laughs> another wave, going back out, and like kind of yeah so cool to watch you like so efficient and then even like sometimes you would like rest and put your hands on your knees and kind of glide a little bit to rest your legs and stuff like that so uh, that was really impressive do you have any any pointers on pumping technique um the the biggest thing pumping is finding the right rhythm and speed for your foil uh, um and being able to like uh learn to have enough control of your pump to be able to, to vary like your, your speed and tempo um, until you find that. Um, and it, it took a while of like tail wing tuning and front wing and, and board placement to get a nice rhythm and, and uh, be able to ride super efficiently. Another, another cool thing pumping is if you, if you want to go for a super long time, the spot and waves and conditions make a massive difference so all of my longest waves have been on at spots with a good amount of power right off the peak <clears throat> and a sh ideally two peaks next to each other and a, a pretty consistent wave um, that's why big bigger waves are good because what, what, what you can do is only stay on like pump out to a wave and only stay on it long enough to get your speed back up and then instantly kick out again and basically do figure eights between the two peaks. Um, and the goal is to not pump between the two. So you, you just stay on it long enough to uh, get to get your speed back up. So you like kick out with enough speed so you can just glide into the next wave without even pumping at all. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. That, I, I've had some like 45 minute rides and, uh, it, it was it was at that same that same kind of setup where you, you drop down the face of maybe a head high wave and then just two pumps to the next peak and do the same thing the other way. Um, and the only limiter was was really how consistent the waves were. So what what killed me there was uh, was a big break in the set. 
So I know, I know you've tried a lot of different wings and uh, foils and you, you design them as well. So what, um, what's your favorite right now? Like which wing do you use for like a combination of pumping and surfing? Like what's your favorite? Um, I use a 1080 mid aspect mostly right now. Um, and, and I vary the tailwing depending on the condition. So if I'm surfing and doing some low speed pumping, I'll use a different tailwing. Um, and if, I, if I'm at, if I'm going like high speed downwind or, or winging, I'll use a, I'll use a, a tailwing more suited to that. But I actually have one of those wings right here. Okay, um, the screen share. So this is uh, sure. this is a version of that 1080. I I have one in, in carbon, but this is a carbon insert. Um, and it's just a design up and I've been kind of refining for, for a few months. Um, so this is like CNC really well. out of G10. Yeah. This is CNC out of G10 with a, with a, a 11 mil. So this is a 11 millimeter thick carbon. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's insert, it's glassed in here or epoxy in here. And there's no, you can't feel any gap mm -hmm. between the, uh, between the two materials. And this is all credit to Dennis Parton at, at Tectonics Maui. Um, he does just an insane job of, of, uh, CNCing and, and finishing these wings. It's, it's yeah, super impressive. Beautiful. So that, and that's for the signature, um, line. No, no, this is just my own stuff. It's your um, own design. I originally did it to fit a, a super modified meal fried fuselage, but I have it here. <laughs> I got everything ready. So I've. I made this fuselage just just to fit those front wings. Um, I don't know; it might be kind of hard, hard to, to see behind your black shirt. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah it looks really beefy, huh? It's it's beefy in the center, but but really the center is. So I use a a, a signature, an old signature unifoil mask, mm -hmm. um, and the, the center is just big enough for that connection, and the rest is pretty skinny. Here it is. Right. I'll so you trying to lower the drag, but still keep it stiff enough. Yeah. Yeah. This is a this is a Moses fuselage for reference. Right. So it's, it's pretty similar in size to the Moses. So the, it's kind of the width is the same, but the thickness is it's thicker, so that gives it a little bit more rigidity by the mat around the mass. Yeah. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's just big enough to fit that that mass connection. So you do you do foil designs um, right now. You're working with Signature and Neil Pride, right? You and you're kind of yeah. A so designer, I yeah. I've done I've done some work with with Signature and Neil Pride, and um, I'm pretty happy with with how it all turned out. Um, I can uh, I don't know how to explain it. The Neil Pride thing was kind of funny. I I met Robert Stroy, who was at the time the, the Neil Pride foil guy. Uh, just at the beach and we started talking designs and, and I was like, Oh, we're looking, we're looking for someone to make a foil. And I heard about your designing stuff. And, and so somehow I, I ended up designing a, a foil set for them. And, or I, I did, originally designed one wing. It's was, it was called the medium slim. And there's some pretty cool videos of Kaohi riding it, but it went really well. Um, mm -hmm. So after that, I designed a whole line, but it's kind of like being thrown into the fire as far as as far as designs because we didn't do any prototyping so i got one shot like you got to design something and it goes straight to a, a stainless production mold and so that was pretty intimidating for the for the first time um but i'm, I'm actually really happy with how, how it all came out and that's awesome i think it's, it's available now i've been seeing some some videos of people writing it okay Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's super impressive for you at, at 20 years old to be um, like a professional designer basically already. And yeah. And, and I, that design was probably one and a half years ago. So, uh, so yeah. and you kind of started using 3d modeling software back in eighth grade, you said like with that, that kind of was your yeah. first class project that you worked on with the 3d modeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, can mm -hmm. you, like earlier you showed me on your computer, you had some, um, yeah, you design stuff. So maybe show us a little bit and talk a little bit about what what kind of stuff you do on on the design side. That's super interesting. I find. Yeah, I can I can show a little bit of it. So 
this is this is I, this the stuff I, I can I'm showing is mostly really old stuff. So my modeling yeah, is definitely give, don't give away there, any but. trade secrets. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see, share screen. So here's the, the, fus the fuselage I just showed you. Um, there's two, we did two versions of it. The one on the left broke and the one on the right is super solid. And they, it's, it's amazing how, how much like a tiny difference around here will make. So what, just oh, it just a little to bit. the front between the mass and the fuselage, it's a little bit more thick. Yeah. Like it, it's kind of hard to see. Yeah, no, I but can see you it. See yeah. how it's a I little rounded there. In there, yeah. yeah. That's the difference between super solid and and just bending until it, it breaks. Wow. Um, but yeah, these I are kind mean, of funny. I found on our on our wings too, like having that little bit more, um, especially between the mass and the and the front wing. It's just, the forces are amazing. You know, like the so that they really are an important area right there. And the other thing is. is is having your volume distribution along along the length of the fuselage as smooth as possible because any breaks in that aluminum doesn't like um and that that would be a failure point hmm. um, another big difference is the hole depth was different so this one had too deep of holes and that took a lot of material out of the, the top of this fuselage where this one has slightly shallower holes that are still strong enough for the to bolt the wing on but leave a lot more material in, in the top of the fuselage where, where you really need that strength. Interesting. You know, I, I um, added um, an axis fuselage that mm -hmm. cracked right at the front of the, the square mast opening, you know, like kind of like right at the end of the square mast opening. And yeah. I was wondering, I mean, I'm, I guess, I guess it makes it more intercompatible to have that square opening, but I, I was thinking, wouldn't it make more sense to have that mass opening in in the shape of the mass, like the um, you know thinned out to back and front, so that you have more material around the mast? You know what I mean? Without having a square yeah. a square end on the mast, if you just put the mass directly into the fuselage, it would make it stronger between the mass and the fuselage. Is what I was thinking. Yeah, I'm not an expert on on structure, so uh, someone smarter than me should would know more but um it's probably better not to have sharp corners on your on your mast uh mast insert yeah but this i guess it just makes sense if you want to switch between a carbon mast and an aluminum mast or whatever or different different size mass because yeah. if you had if you had the profile of the mast and you could only use that one mast with the fuselage i guess so that, that i think that's the main yeah. reason why they're doing that yeah. yeah, and it's a pretty good way to. I think these are based off of whatever Tuttle or Probox, Probox inserts, so it's a mm -hmm. it's a well proven design. So, what about wings? Like, what have you learned uh, about wing design? So, yeah, these are tails I did for Signature. Um, these both were based off of uh, a tail that I hand shaped and cleaned up the profile and, and cleaned it up a lot. Um, but I was riding the, the stealth and the albatross a lot at the time and made G10 and, and wood core carbon layup tails that I really, really liked and worked awesome with those foils. And um, so, yeah, I based these off of it and they go really, really good on the, on, on the stealth, especially. So um, they look, made they this look one. very similar except for the tips, right? I mean, yeah, they are very similar. Um, this one, this one has a little more span and tips. Mm -hmm. I made it basically for the one six five uh, albatross, and this one was pretty much made for the one seventy five still. Um, and so, so I find the, the other angles and everything like the, the the wing tips were needed because I don't know the first the. Uh, the high aspect wings just like a little bit more yaw stability also because the mass the different there's a difference in mass placement between the two foils yeah like for for people that don't know that much about foil tails i, I always say like that those those tips are kind of almost like fins on a board it gives you like directional stability and having a flatter yeah. tail, you, it just makes the tail more loose, like having basically smaller fins or, or like um, you can kind of slide out the tail almost. Or like you're saying, yaw, you can kind of turn on, on the mast instead of doing that. Yeah, rate. and the, the, the other thing I 
I really paid attention to when doing tips like this, um, cause I've got a few tales like it is I wanted to make the tips thin enough and small enough that at low speed, you can still pivot and stall the tips out or wa wash them out. And so at, at low speed coming up the face, you can still pivot the turn, but going, going fast, they would lock in. Hmm. Um, so I made them thin and, and, and low cord and pretty vertical. Yeah. Low drag probably. Yeah. So good for pumping. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. What about front wings? So front wings, these are a bunch of, a bunch of front wings that I, uh, that I worked on with Neil pride. Um, some of these made it to production. Some of these didn't. Um, for example, this is the XXL 2300, uh, these are both 1700s, but with different different aspect ratios and mm -hmm. profiles. And small, medium, large, extra large. Um, and this is super interesting. And, and this is where I learned most of my, or a, a, a lot of my idea of, of how I should design foils and how to do you know center connections and. Uh, it's, it's helped me a lot. Uh, and these are these are some tales. Yeah, I mean that's so super that, impressive that you're already doing all this stuff at at your age. I mean, I can only imagine where you're going to go from there. So, I mean, what what are your plans in the future in terms of like that kind of stuff? Like, do you have any professional aspirations to become an engineer or design like designer? What what is what are your plans? Um, so I'm. I'm for now, I'm pretty. I'm pretty happy. Uh, I get to, you know, delve super deep into design, and I get to surf every day while I'm while I'm young and living in Hawaii. So right now, I'm, I'm pretty happy. But in the future, it would be nice to do something other than than design for the surf industry, and it would be nice to go to school and and further explore this kind of path. Well, I mean, it seems like to me, it seems like you're doing fine teaching yourself. And I, I mean, for things like, you know, in the water, the foiling and winging, I mean, it's so much more like Rob Whittle was saying too, it's, it's more about the feel and, and, you know, you can have the scientific mm -hmm. theories to explain it afterwards, but it's really without the, you know, trying it and feeling it out and, and trying to figure out what how what works and what doesn't work actually in the water you don't really know what's going to work or not until you try it really and it's otherwise it's just yeah so that's 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 what i've been getting into recently uh is 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 first i went super deep into like simulation and and trying to predict how these wings work but some of the results i got didn't match up with what i felt in the water so i've been slowly clawing my way back to finding okay, this is what happens on the computer and this is what I feel in the water. And ideally, I want to be able to predict everything on the computer and, and run through design. And so in the last month or so, I've been getting closer and closer to, to doing that. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> and I definitely am not an expert on it um, by any means. Well, I mean, pretty impressive. I, I don't know if you're not an expert. I don't know who is. And then you also design boards, right? Like you, you said, you, yeah. you do some board designs and then you work with Mark Rappahorst. He, he make, builds them for you, basically. Yeah, huge thank you to Mark Rappahorst. Um, he, he's amazing. And uh, his construction is, is unmatched so far. Um, but you know, I'll share my screen again. Yeah, show us so, some board designs. These are these are some old downwind boards I I prototyped. So this this is one that actually came out. You can probably see on my Instagram page. It's a it's a blue board, white stripes, big big stamp, six zero by twenty something stand up board. I think it's twenty five. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what I this is the this is the first design. I was like, oh, super psyched on a on a sunken deck. Um, my phone's going off, but. There are some practical limitations to making this, like the thickness of the blank you need. Um, and so ended up making this, uh, tried, some, tried some interesting stuff with the rocker and it worked really well. Um, and it kind of led me to my, my, my more recent board with the pintail because this, this board, there's kind of two, I, I found there's two ways to get it to waves. 
downwind, you can either gl- paddle and glide into them, or you can move the board a lot and kind of pump into them. Right. And so this board did insane for gliding into waves. Right. Um, and I found it worked, it worked really well prone downwinding because you don't have the ability to pump up onto foil. But stand up, I had a hard time because, because of all this, this, this volume and width of the tail um, and also low rocker, it was hard to, to get it up onto foil. Um, What's the bottom design on this one? Like the, the bottom shape? The bottom shape is pretty flat. I I checked some interesting stuff on the rocker. There's but is that the, convex the center rocker? There's a concave here, and the center rocker is different from the rail rocker. Um, mm. Yeah, the the bottom's actually this is actually the bottom surface of an airfoil. Uh, so, and you're saying that because the the because it's kind of flat and straight on the bottom, it, it's good for gliding in, but not as good for pumping into pumping up onto the foil. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And I, it could be fixed with more rocker in the tail, mm-hmm. but then at, at, at planing speeds, it really doesn't, that rocker tends to stick, right? Um, and the, the takeoff speeds we're getting to downwind are, are into the planing speed. So um, you, you can't have that. And it ended up with, 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 with my pintail design, which still can be improved, but I'm, I have basically dead flat rocker out the tail uh, so it can release and plane at, at speed, but not a lot of surface area or or volume in the tail. So it can still it can still move and pump pump onto foil. Ah, I see. So you're keeping the bottom flat, but just by, by having a narrow tail, it allows you to kind of you know like hop on hop up on the foil easier. Yeah, and I think I think Dave's designs are probably a, a more refined version of this. Uh huh. Um, but. This the board I've been riding works really, really well. Awesome. And the other cool thing is, is because there's so little material in the nose and tail, um, it reduces your swing weight a lot, and it changes the center of gravity of the board. So on this 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 pintail board, I pretty much stand in the in the dead in the center, and so there's no nose in front of you for, for that swing weight. So it rides really like a five four. Yeah. Um, so next board is probably going to be a 6.4 instead of a 6.0 and 22 wide or something. So that's for downwind foiling. What about wing foil board design? Like what's, what, what how, how does it differ from stand up and foil board design? Like what kind of boards do you, do you design or do you oh, wing, winging? Yeah, wing, wing foil is funny uh, because pretty, you could pretty much get anything up on foil, but it really matters in light wind. Uh, right. What I found is you want not my pintail board and you want, or, or you don't want any of my stand-up boards because they're hard to, for some reason that they're hard to steer. It's something with the it's outline and the, and the low rocker makes them like when you, when you in the tra- uh, planing transition zone or speed, they'll do opposite steering like a boat or like a race stand-up board. Oh yeah. Rail steering. Okay. Yeah, and it's probably a low nose rocker or something, but uh, yeah, definitely avoid that. Uh, and my my pintail board has so much area in the nose versus the tail, but the nose pushes down going upwind, and you need to compensate for that with extra tail uh, tailing angle, and that that adds so a lot of drag. You're saying when you're up on the foil, having that fat nose kind of has like more drag in the wind, basically. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, big time. So, so, um, if you designed a, do you, have you designed a board that's just for wing foiling or what would yeah. the design specs would be on a, on a wing foil? Board? Um, pretty much just take your prone board and scale it up like direct, like you can scale all dimensions up to five foot and it's, you have a perfect wing board. Yeah. So if, um, if, you, if you just had one wing board for you, um, that you can use in light wind and all wind conditions, like what, what size and volume do you think would be good that you would use right now? I guess. 5 to 24 wide and 70 to 75 liters. Sorry. F- the bottom again, 5 by 5 probably 75 liters. Oh, wow. Um, that's pretty similar to what I, re- I have a, 
Four, and six the, the by bottom eight liters. Yeah. Sorry, as far as bottom shape, super simple. No concave. No, nothing special. No steps. No concave. Just as simple as possible. Yeah. Um, because so, that I found that gets you up really fast. Yeah, I mean, I like you know, and, and Dave Kalama talked about it too. But there's that theory that the con the convex shape just kind of releases from the water easier. Like the board when it comes off the water, the water just mm -hmm. kind of slides off of it. Versus concaves and hard edges, sometimes the water can kind of stick to it, or like the surface tension of the water kind of gets stuck on the on those hard edges, you know. And the, yeah, the other thing, the other thing with the wing board is sometimes like. If, when you touch down, a lot of the times you're touching down at a weird angle to chop, and concaves and sharp edges in the in the front, instead of instead of just going through it, uh, will will create a, a lift in some direction and shoot you off one way or another. Um, so yeah, simple bottoms like convex or or, or light single concave it works. Um, I, I totally agree with that. But I mean, obviously, there's two, two schools of thought here. Like a lot of the prone boards have a lot of like, you know, a lot of concaves and sharp edges and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, there, there's got to be some advantage to it. I mean, I guess it has more lift at lower speeds, creates more lift. But yeah, like I said, there's definitely downsides. So it's like, so what's your philosophy? Yeah. On that? As far as my experience riding them, I haven't found any advantages, but they look really cool. <laughs> and they do make a lot of lift at low speed. Yeah. Um, so does it help a little bit with the takeoff, or is it, but I guess on on balance, do you think don't think it's worth it to have all those concaves and hard edges? Yeah, I don't. Personally, I don't think it's worth it. Um, I don't mean any disrespect to anyone who does it because done right, they can work really well. Um, okay. Yeah. Something that that's really helped me when when I you know setting up the board, like was when you said like you you check your basically the thickest part of the foil. If you have your board mm -hmm. upside down, if you lift up the board by the foil, the thickest part of the front wing profile, mm -hmm. then it should the board should be pretty much flat and balanced. Yeah. Out, right? So I thought that was really helpful, and then you know, and it's interesting too because sometimes different wings like i have an axis foil and i changed from the 760 to the 810 and the mm -hmm. for some reason like the distance of that profile is so much different that i have to go from the 710 is like at the front of my box and on the eight yeah uh, the 760 sorry and then on the 810 it's like all the way in the back you know so it's like a bit pretty big difference where the where the foil is located in terms of you know keeping my feet in the same position the same foot strap positions mm -hmm. Yeah, the biggest part of that is, is keeping your, it, it keeps your front wing in the same position. So they probably have different distances between the front wing and the mast. Right. And so the mast will move, but the, but your front wing stays in the same spot. Right. And I, I guess, and then I was thinking about why, th why it is that it works well like that. And then I guess when you're kind of, when you're pumping and unweighing the board, the board by itself is kind of balanced on, on the foil. So it's not like it wants to like nose dive or, or, or stall or whatever, even if you completely yeah. unweigh it, the board will be kind of um, sitting there and gliding right by itself. Well, my, my kind of school of thought around it is ideally you, you want the board to fly pretty neutral as far as foot pressure. Right. And mm -hmm. you want that foot pressure to be consistent across all, all speeds. You want it to be consistent across, if you're in a turn or, or if you're going straight um, or if you're pumping. So what doing that does is it, it puts the center of gravity of the board over the, over the, the center of lift of the wing. Right. And that means when you, when you put it in a turn and put some extra G force on it or, or uh, yeah, mainly if you put it in a turn with that extra G force, it won't change the balance. If, you, if it's nose heavy and you put, and you put in a turn, that center of gravity is going to push, push down and it'll pull your nose into the water. Um, and if it's too far back, it'll do the opposite and pull you out of the water. Um, and so that, that's a baseline. And depending on, the, you know, I, I always take a tool with me in the water and, and change it a little bit depending on how the foil tuned, but yeah, um, that's yeah, interesting. It makes a big difference. So, you know, something that I noticed for myself, like when I, when I used to just stand up paddle surf 
or prone surf. I used to have my back foot a little bit more forward, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But then when I started wing foiling, my back leg always got so tired from always putting more pressure on my back yeah. foot. And so what I started doing was putting my back foot further and further back. So basically now I have my feet. So the, the center of lift of that foil underneath me is kind of right between my feet. And I've got just equal yep. pressure on both feet. And that's something I learned from wing foiling. And now I also do it when I'm stand up foiling, I always have that same foot position just because it's way more comfortable and efficient. Right. I mean, is that kind of how you balance out too, or. Yeah. And if, if you watch a lot of my clips or uh, watch, uh, I'm usually sometimes my, my back foot's way in front of the mast. Right. And you think, oh, that's weird. Most people have their back foot behind the mast, but my front foot's really far back too. So my, I try and keep my center of gravity always right over the front wing. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I, I just got some downwind clips. There's a good video clip of that. That are pretty. Let's play, play one of these. So is the harbor one of your favorite spots on Maui or? The harbor is a pretty good spot. Um, Co-foiling ruined me. So, so Pier 1 is, is my favorite spot now, uh, <laughs> just directly outside the harbor. But there's also a spot on the west side that's really fun. Uh -huh. um, it's right by Laniapoco, uh, right off to the, the line of side of Laniapoco. And that's, that's one of my favorite waves ever. Nice. Um, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, like that's it's, obviously an older footage and the board looks so huge compared to what you're riding now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really like that board though. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I'm actually going to bigger boards now. Um, I'm, I'm on a, right. I, that's a four Oh that that's on the screen. Um, this one, that's a four Oh by 20. Now I'm riding a four, two by 19. And uh -huh. my next board is a four, six, 18.5. And okay. just to be able to catch the wave easier and paddle back out easier, what's the, what's the um, idea behind going a little bit longer again? Part of it is catching bigger waves. Um, I want, I, I live on the you know, North shore of Maui and, and most of these spots in the winter are, are a bit bigger than, than I want to paddle into on my, on my four, two. Um, the other thing is hitting the, hitting the white water or getting critical in the, in critical sections of the wave. Um, my 4.2 has a nice, a nice rocker curve, but it doesn't have enough rocker. So I basically, on my 4.6, I just extended that rocker curve so that most of the board's the same, but I have a little bit extra nose um, for recovery, mostly. And yeah, so when you put it in, in, a, in a head high bit of foam or, or the lip, it doesn't, doesn't really care. Like you can, you can recover way easier. Mm. So actually, that's another question I had for you on on the rocker. I know, like people have been playing around with like um, the shims underneath the mass plate and stuff like that. And I mean, it's basically you can put a little bit of rocker in the board and get a little bit of the you know is just what's your what is your feeling? And I guess it depends on the foil, of course, too. And do you like to have the 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 mast? Are the plate completely parallel to the bottom of the board, or do you like to have it like a slight rocker to it and the, and the tail, the, where the mass? I do most of, I do most of it in the rocker with the rocker in my board. Um, but I know people are put are going like really almost negative with their shims, so mm -hmm. that's interesting. And I think it works really well on smaller waves where your front wing's running a higher angle of attack. Mm -hmm. On big, I, I found on small waves, I like boards with lower with, a, with almost a parallel angle between the foil and the, the deck or the, the box in the deck. And on bigger waves, I like a lot more tail rock. Um, like toe in. Yeah. Toe I mean, I've I like, noticed I like my front foot up a bit. Yeah. Like to me, like, especially when you're going faster, if, if, you know, like that, having that negative angle helps with lift. And it's a little scary. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, yeah. When you're going I, I, fast and speed. especially like on it, like if you're towing in or going fast and you have that, the nose is pointed down a little bit. As soon as you touch down, it's just scary. slightly you are done. Right. I mean, it's like your board just sucks down when your nose down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Uh, it depends on the wave. And I, I just have a, my boards have a really light tail rock. Curve. Yeah. Um, and I can always shim the front wing too. This, mm. My setup lets me shim the front wing to different angles. So that that's useful. Yeah. So I was going to ask about that too. So do you, I mean, I guess the wing designs you have are mostly like kind of where the, the front wing screws flat onto the fuselage with like two or three screws. And then, um, so it's basically just the screws holding the, holding it down against that flat area. Do you ever have yeah. issues with it, like loosening up or like, I mean, how do you keep those screws completely tight and, and keep, keep it from having any play? Um, I use about, I, I, they're big M8 Torx, Torx head, head screws. Uh, okay. And I use probably six, a, a six inch lever and just crank them down. <laughs> like way, way too tight. Um, but the reason I use that connection is, is a limitation of, of how I build the wings. Um, I make the wings out of a, out of a, pan, a solid panel of T10 or carbon. And on a, on a three axis CNC machine. So there's not, a good way to get enough thickness in the connection area or go in from the side to make, to make like a male, female connection, go foil style. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the on top kind of works really well. Um, for example, I just made this wing to fit access K series fuselage. Uh, hold on a sec. Okay. This is for the access K series. And that's a similar kind of fuselage where it just, it just bolts right on top. Right. Um, and the reason I couldn't do like the black series or, or their old S fuselage is just because it, it's too thick for my panel. Huh. Um, the wing, the, the wings are too thick and the connections too thick. Uh, so this is the only thing that would let me get thin enough. Uh, yeah. So you're really going Pretty super. Much th you're going super thin with your foil um, foil designs, huh? Oh yeah, crazy thin. Just and for I, for higher speeds, right? I mean, that's basically less drag. Is that the idea behind it, or? Yeah, you, you do you do sacrifice a little at at super low speed, um, but I if you use the right foil section, you don't you don't sacrifice stall speed that much. Um, and I don't know. I, so do you use like it. on NASA foil sections or how or do you just modify them or what I, do you come up with your foil sections? I design my own. Yeah. So I design all my own foil sections. So using just trial and error, like what works for you? And no, using Drela's uh, inverse inverse design. So I, I specify, specify the, the surface velocity of the fluid over the, over, over the top and bottom of the wing, basically. And that'll, that'll give you your shape. Huh. So what's the maximum velocity you can fly at with your wings? Uh, it depends. Like that 800, probably top. It, it kind of has a low top speed for the side, size. It probably tops out at like 30 knots. Hmm. Um, just because it's a fairly blunt foil section. But the good thing is with, with that one, it's, it's super stable until that speed. Um, so I actually, I've never hit the top speed on it. I have one right here. This is uh, my 600 toe wing. This one's insanely fast, and I have it's no like clue wing. How, how fast it can go. Yeah, it's basically a kite wing. Um, it's super, super thin. Right. Uh, yeah. So um, what's the idea behind having that pointy tip at, on the front? Like it looks like a kind of like an airplane. Uh, that's just the fuselage being too long for the, for the quarter of the wing. Oh, okay. I need to get it in, I need to set it in the right spot and otherwise it, I would end up with kind of an ugly, ugly front connection. Yeah. So the, um, the tip, um, it, it's not like, it's just kind of to make up for the length of the fuselage. It's yeah. not the design feature really. Yeah, if you're if you're going really fast, like like the America's Cup boats use it, it's called a, a um, what is it called a, a cork bottle fairing, where it, it raises the, uh, it keeps the pressure more even around that connection, and re it, it it reduces cavitation around that in, around the interface of, of multiple wings. But I'm not going fast enough, and I'm not designing it to do that. 
Right. Um, what what about so it what about dihedrals? Do you put dihedral into your wing a little bit or or do you keep I'm, it? I'm flat in pretty there? limited. This one has, has some freedom. Um very slight dihedral in the center. Oh yeah. Um I've got some freedom with wing lifts. Um and the wing lifts on these are, are more for uh, a more like a, a bit of a locked in feeling because if you, if you go dead flat it can it gets some washy sometimes uh -huh. so you can play with with changing your foil section at the tip you can play with uh changing your like winglets or anhedral at the tip um or you can do some fun stuff with twists to get to get a bit more of a locked in feel out of and a flat wing the slightly turned up wing tips is that so you can kind of breach the foil easier or uh, in turn that that yeah it makes a really big difference in in breaching turns um it, it's it's way gentler and uh the, the upward wing tip lets you breach breach the tip at a lower angle so on a flat wing in a turn you can you can breach it it, it doesn't matter if you have a wing lid or not but if you're if you're a little straighter up so like this, any wing will breach, but like this, uh, you want a little bit of a winglet if you're, if you're super worried about breaching. Just so the tip comes out first and, the, and disrupts the water, yeah. water surface less. I've kind, of, I've kind of found the angle between the wingtip and the water surface is super important. So the more perpendicular they are, the gentler of a wingtip breach you'll have in general. Um, foil section makes a huge difference. For example, like the <clears throat> the go foil foil section is insane for breaching. Like you, you never feel it. Um, yeah, the the velocity across the top sur top surface is really consistent. So there's no there's no pressure spikes, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's pretty impressive. <laughs> When you yeah, I mean, some of the turns that my my buddy Derek Hama does on the uh, yeah Masaki on the on the GL and the um, those go, go go foil wings is just amazing. You know, like how it's you can have half the foil out in the turn. <laughs> yeah, pretty sick. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, well, I've, I've um, been having a lot of fun on these. Yeah, I mean, that's super interesting. I could just talk about uh, design this whole for a couple of hours, but uh, I guess we should probably move on to some other things as well. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think everyone that's listening is going to be super interested in this as well, but let's talk a little bit about uh, wing, wing design. So um, in terms of, you know, wing foiling wings, it's, this is kind of yeah. supposed to be a wing foiling show more than anything, but um, what, what's your experience? What kind of wings have you tried and what, what do you like the best and so on? Um, so I, I work with a, with a wing, a, a pretty talented wing designer, talented wing designer. And so get to try a lot of prototypes from, for a lot of different brands and, and a lot of different materials and styles and handles and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it seems like, I don't know how to explain. I'm going to try to show some. They're going to more, more, more tension in the canopy, a flatter shape, um, a, a stiffer shape. And you can get a big increase in 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 speed and efficiency from that. Um, so low. I really like having. You like having a flatter wing shape, a less profile, basically. Uh, yeah, definitely a flatter pro flatter profiles are, are nice. Um, mm -hmm. Just because the the parent wind angle it can handle is, is a lot lower, um, makes it nice for light wind or or going upwind at really high ang or tight angles. Right. It doesn't um, flutter as much when you're going at a tight angle, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing is, is stability. I'm not an expert on, on wing design, mm -hmm. but having a, sta a stable wing that's, that, that flies neutral when depowered is, is, is really important um, and makes, makes gusts a lot easier. So I've been liking the wing rides and the Ensys. Um, I tried some PPC stuff that's insane. Um, and also the BRM, I, I, I really love the BRM wing. Um, mm -hmm. I think. So my, those my are the dad, ones you've, you've tested and helped kind of with the design and so on. Uh oh. So um, the BRM, yeah. So talk about the BRM. What's what makes that one special? Um, so my, my dad's had a BRM wing for, for a long time now. And the way they eat gusts 
is super impressive. Um, that that's what kind of surprised me the most when I read it. Um, in, in gusty conditions, it's just like smooths out everything. Your your power is really consistent, and they they can handle high speed high speeds well. Um, the low wingspan is nice for surfing too. So do, I, do I, I haven't tried the BRM wings. What, what is it about it that you think makes it work like that, or what, what are the design pretty, features that you think wing. work well on the BRM wings? They're pretty low aspect. Um, that probably helps. I, I really don't know. I, uh, the handles are super solid, um, pretty low flex, and uh, they don't have any windows, so it's, it's a really consistent reaction or material across the canopy. Yeah. I mean, personally, too, like uh, after trying wings without windows, I kind of like like... It, I, I like not having a window, but um, what, what's your take on that? Have windows versus no windows. That's kind of always one of those big arguments. If you're riding around a lot of people, um, and especially a lot of beginners, use a window. A window is really nice. Um, being able to, to easily check your tack like before you do a tack or drive is, is great. Um, I tend to ride like at Hokipa where there's not a ton of people uh, and there's a clear rotation. So I, I prefer wings without windows. Yeah. It's also kind of better for like packing them up and you don't have to worry about creasing it and so on. Right. I mean, yeah. And, uh, and lighter weight. And I don't know, there's a lot of advantages to not having a window, but yeah, definitely the safety aspect. Although I find that, um, it's pretty easy to just look under your wing, right? You just lift it up a little bit and you look. It is, you know, the, the, the the best windows I've tried are on the new Cabrina wing. The, the windows are, are massive, uh -huh. and you can they're they're really the first one or one of the first ones like you can you can see everything through. Um, yeah, here you're flying away, huh? <laughs> one thing I really like about about the these wings is the handles. It's a soft handle, but you have probably a good 10, 12 inches to, to move your hand around. Um, and that's really nice for, for adjusting to different conditions and, and different kinds of riding. Um, kind of like a boom. Yeah. Having the longer handles, it does help with tacking and stuff like that. Cause you can put one oh, yeah. hand right next to the other one and stuff. But, um, do you find that sometimes the longer handles have a little bit more give, like, so there's less control control with your wrists. Do you find that at all? Or Yeah, I, I do. And some of the newer styles of those handles that I've tried are, are stiffer and have a lot less of that. You, you, have, you definitely have more control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, nice. The one thing I really like about booms is in the, in the last week, I started riding with a harness. And mm. having a boom is really nice if you're, if you're riding with a, with a harness and harness line. Right. I've never tried harness before, but I've, like Alan Kidd has talked about it and I'm interested in trying it. I definitely would do want to try it out. Yeah, it's nice um, because I, I, I kind of started doing it because I've been doing upwinders from Kanaha to Kuau on Maui. And I don't know how many miles, but it's probably like five miles upwind. Yeah. Uh, and it was just, it just destroys your arms and your hands. So it's nice to have something to take the load off. Right. So, was this from your knee when you had your knee surgery? Oh, when did I have my knee surgery? Uh, yeah. Or just so like you're right. That's right after I, I injured it. <laughs> um, so I, I've done that a few times. I originally did it surfing. Uh, just went up for a for a top turn and busted my knee. I was out for a few weeks. Doctor said after probably three weeks, he's like, "Oh, you're good. You should be good to go back in the water." And third wave did it again. Um, so was out for a while after that. Did a ton of PT. Uh, came back. Was good for a few months. And I think I did it again skimboarding. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the what you said. What what was the injury um, originally? So the, the injury originally was from was from surfing. Um, I went for a top turn and dislocated my patella or, or kneecap. Um, so my kneecap went from the center all the way to the, basically to the, the outside side of my knee. 
just for Is a it kind of like from overextending it backwards or like what, what happened? Like, how did it happen? <sighs> Not really sure. Um, it, after all the, all the x-rays and stuff, it seems like just, it's just like a genetic thing. Like my kneecaps, just kind of, kind of far off mm-hmm. or fat kind of far off to the side, especially on my back knee, which got stressed a lot from surfing. Um, that, that kind of tuck knee position you do surfing is not good. <laughs> it's not good for your knee. Um, so it's basically your kneecap kind of slips off the front of the knee. Is that what happened? Like sideways? It, it, it slips. So if, if this is, if this is the top of your knee and you're looking yeah. from, from the front or from yeah. the bottom of your leg, right? Yeah. It's, it's slipped off to the side. Ooh. To the inside um, or the outside of your knee? To the outside. And there's just a little... A little, uh, a little, whatever ligament holding that in, uh-huh. um, as well as your quad. But uh, so the yeah, ligament basically broke when that happened, or the ligament probably stretched the first few times, uh-huh. and then pro- the last few it probably broke. Um, I know in the last one it, it was broken. So what? And then so the surgery they had to replace that ligament, or what happened? So the, yeah, there's it's the surgery is called an MPFL reconstruction. And uh, or replacement, and there's two ways to do it. Where the one way they'll they'll take some of your hamstring and replace that ligament with your hamstring, and the other one is where they take a cadaver from uh, an Achilles or a hamstring and do the same thing. And luckily, I got the cadaver. Um, the cadaver is really strong. It's like it's like a, <laughs> the surgeon put it in a good way. He's like. It's, it's like upgrading from a comp leash to a jaws leash. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my old, you know, my old ligament, like on my left knee is, is the comp leash. And the, the other one is the jaws leash. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's pretty cool. And it, it's, a, it's an amazing surgery. You can actually, it's, it's full weight bearing 45 minutes after. Wow. It's pretty but still, impressive. you have to recover for a while and train. Yeah. Needs. It took it took a, probably a week to get walking again, um, or walking comfortably. And would you say you're hun- back to 100 percent now? Like you can do everything you want. I'd or? say I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm at least 95 percent now. Nice. Uh, the your quad does a lot of work in keeping keeping your kneecap stable, and uh, as long as you you pay close attention to to how tired or exhausted your quad is. And, and I, I've been doing like yoga and, and using the foam roller as a way of managing, uh, of managing it, managing my leg and, and keeping everything kind of stretched out and, 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 uh, it's a good way, good way to do recovery. Um, nice. Um, yeah. So, and it's, yeah, it's definitely, terms of, sorry, go ahead. That, that experience and, and, and doing that a few times definitely taught me a lot about uh, paying attention to my body and, and, and knowing when to, when to stop. Uh, I think that's a valuable lesson to learn early. and knowing how to recover. <laughs> Cause when, when yeah. you're my age, like I'm 53 and it takes a lot longer to recover from stuff like that. So it's good that yeah. you're figuring it out at your age. <laughs> yeah. There've been a few sketchy moments, but it, the last probably few months have been, have been awesome. Nice. So in terms of like, um, other, do you do other like sports cross training hobbies other than foiling and water sports and so on? Um, not too much. I tried to keep a good variety of foiling. Uh, I, I, I've been doing yoga recently, Ashtanga yoga. Um, and that, that's actually been super fun and, and super yeah. interesting. Um, but yeah, occasionally I'll, I'll go uh, mountain biking. That's, that's a good way to cross train. Okay. Um, do you have like a, a routine that you follow every morning or like, a, like what's a typical day in your life? Like starting when you get up out of bed? Not, I don't have a, I don't have a, a super, super uh, strict routine, but generally I, I would wake up and uh, I, I, I do a little bit of stretching in the morning. I do maybe a little bit of rolling depending on, you know, and, and the amount depends on, on how I feel. Uh, and then whatever, eat, eat a, try and eat a good breakfast and, and, uh, do some work, shift, shift tails or, or uh, do some 
designing and to DM. Uh, and then I, I usually go for an afternoon uh, wing or, or surf session. Nice. So the morning is night, kind of your at, busy time for, for getting stuff. The morning is generally my busy time. And also late at night. Late at night, I do a lot of computer work. So most of my designing stuff is, is after dinner. Hmm. So when you work on the computer and you're really into something and you, that, like how long will you stay up and work on your computer? Are you like an all night hacker? Kind of guy or? <laughs> uh, no, it, 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 it depends. I, I try and if I'm really into it, I try and like go to bed before tw at, at 12. I'm like, okay, okay I got I got to stop now. But um, sometimes, sometimes I'll, I'll get really into it. Um, especially if I, if I have a big project I'm working on or, or make a breakthrough and I'll go 10 to 14 hours just locked in yeah. on the wow. computer. Um, so you're more like an, you get creative at night in, in the nighttime, huh? It's like in yeah, well, for example, a foil I just designed, I, I spent probably 10 hours a day straight just for, for a week just like on it, folks super wow. focused and uh, hard That's parts awesome. like rem remembering to, to do stuff in the future like what where do you see wing foiling or foiling going and like do you have any new ideas or new projects that you're working on anything you can share like um stuff that's coming in the future or things you you can imagine or see for the future yeah so my my favorite part of wing foiling is probably the accessibility of it and that you can get so many people you know in the water learning to sail, going fast, having a ton of fun. And you can do it in so many places. Um, I, I've like, you know, I'm at the Harbor a lot and that's kind of the Mecca on Maui for, for learning to, to wing foil. Mm -hmm. And there's, it, it's cool to see entire families that, that sometimes don't even surf um, and, and have never done a wind sport getting up and, and you can watch them improve and, uh, in two weeks, they're they're up and, and going upwind and having a blast. Uh, it's it's definitely this, pretty cool. This uh, video is at the harbor, right? Yeah. This this is pretty cool. Um, where you're kind of handing from the doing a takeoff from the boat ramp and then grabbing the wing on your way out. Talk a little bit about yeah. how you do that. That was funny. I I showed up one day with my wing, I'll, I'll psych to go. I think I just got that, that sail. Um, and it was way too light to go out, but luckily I ran into Scott Mackey and Jason Hall. And I was like, Hey Scott, can you, can you stand at the end of the, the pier and hold my wing? <laughs> um, did a beach start and managed to somehow make it. And actually that, that was a super fun session. Yeah, this looks like you just had to get out to the wind line, pump out to the wind line, and then, then that was windy enough out there, huh? Yeah, it was probably like sub-15 that day. And back on the, the Generation 1 wing, that was, that was pretty light wind. Yeah, that's cool. Um, let's see. Oh, this one, um, this is a yeah, pretty cool. People talk about that one a lot. Um, that was a fun session out on a board of Sean Ordonez's uh, SOS shapes. It looks like your he, front he foot is old, almost on the nose of the board, Em. Yeah, he had an old belly board that he put some foil tracks in. Mm -hmm. And I, I forget how long it was. I think it was a two-foot board. <laughs> um, so the front of, the, my front foot was, was basically off the edge, and my back foot was, was pretty much the same. Um, and it was just a, a good, consistent day at a, at a thousand peaks. Um, uh -huh. And l later that day, I had my longest drive ever. That must be pretty hard to take off on that board, though, right? Yeah, the only I it's it, it you can't catch a wave on it pretty much. So I be, you have to beach start. Oh, that's what you did. That when was the, you beach started and went on. That was the only way I could get it up on foil. Mm. Is, is the beach start. But this, this video is a little deceiving. Like people, people are like, oh my God, how do you pump that far for that long? That's, on the inside, there's a, there's a rock wall and there's, there's backwash coming off the wall. And so most, most of the way out or pretty much all the way out back to the peak, you can get a, 
a decent backwash assist. Right. Um, so the whole time, like pumping, I was less focused on, on my pumping efficiency and more focused on, all right, how do I stay in the power of this, of this tiny little backwash wave? Cool. So you basically time your kick out with like trying to find with, a yeah. bump that's going back out again to take you back out. Yeah. And one, one thing that saves a lot of energy pumping back out into a wave is trying to stop pumping super early and glide into the wave. Um, I, I, I catch myself a lot pumping all the way up until I'm going up the face and then turning when really I, I should be, I should be stopping 30 feet, 15, 30 feet before and just gliding into it. Cause then once you turn, you kind of create more lift. And then once you're on the face and you don't, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Create, yeah. Oh, get the power. You can, the you can save a good three or four pumps. Hmm. Interesting. But then I find like when I first started um, kind of connecting waves, uh, if I stopped pumping too early or turned too early on the wave, then I would yeah. basically drop off before I got on the wave. So it's kind of, you do want to kind of turn pretty high on the wave, right? Um, so the other thing with pumping is staying as high as possible on your mask mm -hmm. because by staying as high as possible, you kind of store, you store your, your gravitational energy and you, you, you lengthen the possible glide slope and it, uh, your wings also more efficient close to the surface. But if you come into doing that really high on your mask, you can use that, all that gravitational energy you've stored, um, to glide into the wave. And then once you're on the wave, you have enough power to, to bring it back up again. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so and I guess that's the reason why you do kind of do those kind of short, quick pumps. So you don't mm -hmm. like, you basically keep the mass pretty high out of the water and, and the foil close to the surface. Yeah. Part of, part of the short, quick pumps is, is they work really well from a, from a body mechanics standpoint uh -huh. where uh, by, by, changing how short and quick or long, like how short or long your pumps are, you can stress your body in different ways. So a really long pump will be easier on your muscles, uh, but uh, you, your, your heart and your lungs will work harder. Mm. Um, and the, the short pumps are harder on your muscles, but don't stress your, your heart or lungs as, as much. So explain why, why do you think, um, the foil creates more, it seems like the foil creates more lift when it's close to the water surface, right? Is it, or is it, is the reason why it's more efficient because there's less mass in the water and has less drag, or is it because uh, it just like, creates more lift when it's close to the surface? What's, what's the theory behind that, that? I don't have a solid answer on it, but, um, I have a few theories. So one of Definitely less mass in the water. That makes a big difference. Um, two, you are moving the, the the foil is moving less water around itself, right? So the the low pressure side of the foil makes a lot of the lift, and it it pull it pulls a lot of water in that water column above it down to make that lift. Um, and by being closer to the surface, there's less water available to pull. And so the foil is actually doing less work and making less drag. Um, I don't think you're making any more lift, but you're definitely making less drag. Okay. Um, the other part of it is by, by bringing your foil close to the surface, this is, this is the part I'm really not sure about, is <clears throat> you could kind of be end plating the tip vortex, especially on really flat foils, um, where there, there might be some kind of interaction with, with the wingtip vortex and the surface of the water that reduces, reduces it. Uh, I see. So you, you basically, because you're closer to the surface, there's less room for it to create turbulence basically on the tips. Yeah. I'm not sure about that because, because if you're really close to the surface, it actually creates a wave and that could, that could use more energy than, so I'm, I'm not sure about it, Yeah, but definitely moving less water around and having less water, uh, or less mass in the water makes a difference. Interesting. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out why that works. I mean, I've also noticed that there's definitely a ground effect. Like if you're pumping over shallow reef, like and the reefs right mm -hmm. underneath you, you can kind of push the on ground the effect, foil yeah. harder, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Some something I do a lot winging is is like 
go, especially if there's a sandy beach, is go really fast towards shore and put the foil in like in like six inches of water and try and glide down the beach as far as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to stay super high and, and, and almost touch your foil to the bottom and, and see how far you can glide in, in ground effect. Only works on really flat wings though. Yeah. Um, generally like, ground effect. Not, I, mean, I don't do it in six inches of water, but we have a spot where you kind of have to go over the shallow reef to go it, come in, you know, and, and uh, you feel it. and definitely, yeah, you feel like basically even at lower speeds, you, you just get more lift off the foil when you're right, right over the reef, you know? Yeah. I think the general rule on planes is that if you're within half your wingspan from the ground, um, ground effects, uh, whatever, uh, has as a, as a real effect or a noticeable effect right within half your wingspan wow so how long is this video um this is like eight minutes seven and a half minutes and you're still flying it's amazing yeah i guess that was the dog that can't believe his eyes huh the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah jeep classic uh jeep gp is hilarious yeah yeah the, uh, yeah if you haven't seen this video you gotta listen to the content uh, comments his commentary is funny. awesome yeah it's classic yeah yeah. I almost, I almost want him to just like, just like hire him to film and, and commentate on it because it's <laughs> great. It's kind of hard to see like this, but um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I actually started passing the wing behind my back when I'm going upwind on the wave, mm -hmm. but I, like I guess you're going downwind and then you're passing it in front of you, um, kind of on a bottom turn. So yeah, talk a little bit about that, the the technique. You're um, using. It's mostly, uh, I mostly do it to, to control my upper body rotation. So by, by passing it to my front hand on the bottom turn, it lets my shoulders open up towards the face of the wave. And by switching it to my back hand on the top turn, I can actually twist my body around and uh, point my front arm more far, farther backwards. And more recently, I've been, I, I, I've been using the wings power and leverage through turns. Yeah. And the, my limitation is, is still when I, when I do that, I, I I'm, I'm still working on it, but I like using the, the power of the wing on the top turn, but then, it, then your wing is still in your front hand. So on the way down, you have to switch it and open your hands up again. And it's hard to get your speed. You need a bunch of speed to get out in front of the wave for your, for your next bottom turn. So it's, it's in progress. Right. Um, got to get some video of that soon. Let's talk a little bit about wing size. Um, mm -hmm. like, do you, what, what wing size do you like to use? Do you like to use a bigger wing uh, for jumping or do you like to use a smaller wing for handling or like what's, I use, I have a two five. I love when it's nuking and I, I, I have a bunch of sizes, but pretty much 99% of the time I use my, my two five or my three five. Um, and the, the two five is great, but, but hard to get up. So you, you need a, a seriously nuking day. Um, and with the three five, uh, I can get up prone in probably 18 knots and I can get up, stand up in six knots. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess probably you're always trying to, I mean, my theory is always like try to use the smallest wing I can and get up yep. on basically, because once you're up, you don't really need much of much wing size. Yeah. Way. Recently I found, I don't need anything bigger than a three, five, really. A three, five will get me up in, in the lowest wind my foil can fly in. So, so. Which is about how many knots would you say? Six. Six knots. With yeah. the three five wing, mm -hmm. it's funny because there was some, but and like, about a thousand square centimeter foil. Yeah, Rob Whittle was saying um, that he likes to use like either a three more three meter or four meter, and that mm -hmm. four meter is kind of the biggest he uses now, and and he can get up in ten to twelve knots. And there was a bunch of people that were commenting that that's impossible and blah, blah, blah. But no I, mean, I kind of have to agree that you can get up with a small wing and pretty light winds. I mean, sometimes you might have to wait for a little gust or, and just really, really work at it. But <laughs> once you're up, then you don't really don't need that much wing, right? It's really, it's really all dependent on your board. 
if you have a good board, you can get up with a much, much smaller wing and way less wind. Um, so yeah. what, what, what kind of board is that that you would use to get up? I use my downwind stand-up board. But didn't and you say you need to have the planing speed to get that thing going? Yep. Yeah. So you get it up to planing speed with a small wing. Yeah, on my on my thousand centimeter wing, the, the takeoff speed is like eight, eight nine miles an hour. Hmm. Um, but if I check in light wind, I use a different tail wing that, that probably lowers that about a mile an hour. So a bigger tail wing or more angle on the tail wing or both? A different foil section. Different foil. So okay, so a little bit thicker. But same section. size. Oh, okay. It's just a, a different, yeah, different foil section, um, and a little more cord. Interesting. So, like, like the front wing compared to the tail wing, um, mm -hmm. like in terms of, you know, the effect it has on the on the foiling experience. Like, how would you compare it? Like, is it like eighty twenty or seventy thirty, or is it hard? Just hard to Ooh, quantify it like that. It's hard to quantify. Um, seventy thirty or or sixty forty is probably a good a good number. Yeah. Um, actually, no, it's not 70. Hmm. So basically what I'm saying is like, I guess with the same front wing, about how much can you change it by changing the tail wing? You know, it depends how well tuned the rest of your setup is, but I'd probably give 50% or 60% to, to your board box placement and your tail wing tuning. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. so if, so if those are good, huge. It, it really makes a difference. Like it doesn't matter what front wing you're on, it'll it'll ride good if your tail wing is tuned right and you and it's in the right spot on the board. Um, and if it's if it's off, then you're gonna no matter what front wing you're on, you're gonna have a really hard time riding. Okay. Well, I think we're going super long, but I, I, it's super interesting to me. So I'm sure other people will find it interesting as well. So I'm just gonna keep going. Um, yeah. Um, so what was I going to say? Sorry. <laughs> oh, beginners. So like, if you have a friend that wants to learn how to wing foil or you're taking mm -hmm. out someone, like what are the, you know, what are your tips and like, what are some common mistakes you see people make and so on? Um, oh, common mistakes. Uh, so when I, every time I teach people, uh, the first thing I do is put them on a reasonably sized foil, but put it all the way back in the box. And for their first few waves or for half, half of the first session or until they're comfortable, have them take off and keep the board on the water. Just have them keep the board on the water, ride the wave like that. Don't even think about coming up on foil. Um, that'll get them one, their, their safety position and safe, like that, that's their safety, uh, safety move. They know how to keep it on the water. And the other thing that'll do is get them used to riding with a mast, big mast and foil under their board. Um, so once, once they're comfortable riding the board, touch down on the water for the, for the wave, <clears throat> then it's time to move, to, to move the foil forward a little bit and slowly start bringing it up on foil. Um, it's nice to have a, a consistent wave like the Harbor that, that, that is smooth, smooth water and, and, uh, decent power for a long time. Um, and at least teach them a little bit beforehand on, and so they understand a little bit about how the foil works um, because that's another thing too. Do you do you <clears> for, handling on, on the beach before you let them go in the water? Oh yeah, big time. Yeah, um, yeah wing handling on the beach is huge. Uh, a, 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 a big problem I see is people try and control the wing too much. Uh, really what you want is your, your front arm is your anchor and your back, your back arm does most of the control and just the weight of your back arm will keep the wing flying. Um, so I, I kind of teach people the way I learned kiting, which is sit on the beach and learn how to put and hold the wing in different positions. So, you know, one o'clock, uh, three o'clock, two o'clock, one o'clock, 12 o'clock in the wind window. And, uh, and uh, you know, vary the power and just get comfortable and familiar with it before getting in the water. Mm. Um, because 
for a lot of people winging they're they're getting on the foil board for the first time too and it it's a totally unfamiliar space where you're not comfortable with with any part of it yeah. um and and having some baseline understanding and experience and building a tiny bit of muscle memory will make a big improvement in their in their learning you know, Alan could have said that he he puts people on a on an old windsurf board with a dagger board yeah. in the middle, and then he just makes and once they can go back and forth and stay upwind, then then they're kind of ready to go try the foil. And that's that's how he does it. Totally. And that's, I've also heard people say that um, they put people on on the board and just take the foil, the wings off the foil, so it's just the mast. So mm-hmm. they can't busy, they can't foil, but the mass has enough. Um, it's kind of like almost like a dagger board because it keeps you yeah. from drifting too much, right? So I th- thought that's yeah, kind of a good are, idea. I've never tried it, but that's a kind of a good idea. Those are all good ideas. Taking the wings off the mass can make it a lot less stable, though. So yeah. it would be interesting to, to, to make something that would bring that stability back. Almost like a keel, or just use a, an old windsurf board. Maybe, what if you took off the tail wing, but then would make it just. In, oh, take stable. off just the front wing could work. Take take off the front wing and leave the tail. Wing. The front wing. Yeah. That could that could work. Or maybe use a really small wing that doesn't is not going to lift. Because I mean, I think even if you tell people don't lift off the water once they start going fast, yeah. it's kind of hard to control, like keep it from flying up. Yeah. That's the other thing I do uh, teaching surf foiling is. I never put them on a really big front wing the first time. Right. I put them on like a, a front wing I would surf on. Um, so that if they do lift, it's not like they can bring it back down and it's, 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 they can control it. They can, they can handle it. They can handle it. Right. Um, but I think for learning to wing foil, there's definitely an advantage of using a bigger wing because you end up yeah. having, it's more stable and you can fly slower mm-hmm. at lower speeds and you can take your time through transitions and stuff. So yeah, once you're comfortable starting, going in and out. Yeah. When, big, if you're a beginner wing. buying a new foil, don't like get a big, big foil that lifts at low speeds, basically. Right. I mean, that's, is that what you would advise as well? For beginners? Um, yeah. Just get something easy to ride and stable. Right. my advice and a good board a good board is, uh, makes yeah a a floaty stable board right i think the new the new fanatic boards look look nice they have a real simple bottom um yeah the, the customs are always nice but the, the amos shapes boards are, are great uh, a lot of stuff out there works yeah no i mean the equipment is definitely improving a lot like just the second and third generations of the wings are are so much better than what what we used to write in the beginning you know yeah uh <clears throat> another thing a lot of people on the beach ask me about tacking um packing a lot of people have trouble tacking or oh, tacking um, yeah the, yeah the biggest thing i noticed and actually alan could use taught me kind of taught me how to how to tack is People switch the wing, switch their hands on the wing way too late, um, and that so so they'll, they'll go into attack and forget to, and, and don't switch their hands, and then they end up falling backwards, mm-hmm. or there's too much drag or or something. So in attack, if you come in with 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 a decent amount of speed, you can actually switch your hands super early, and by switching your hands and bringing the wing over your head, it'll it'll force the rest of your body and foil to follow. Um, and keep you in control the whole time. And that, that actually usually does the trick for people. So if anybody out there is having trouble tacking, switch your hands super early. Yeah, that's a good tip. Usually I works. Also, and then, sorry, go yeah. ahead. And then uh, talking to my dad because, because he learned to tack on his own. Uh, and he said riding behind people who are good at tacking and, and watching as they do it really helps. Yeah, I think what what... I've learned too is like you want to kind of throw the wing over your head so and kind of with I think with the backhand before you let it go you kind of throw it so that that it yep. tack tips over you know so that when it when you grab it on the other side it's already in the right position you don't have to like bring it over to the other side yeah I when I pack I always give my my backhand a little like push right and let the momentum of the wing bank it over Right. So that way, when you grab it on the other side, it's already in the right position. You yeah. get power right away. You don't have to like um, bring it over yeah. back into the power position. Yeah. So totally. Those are good tips. Yeah. Um, what about um, fo- the foiling part of the turn? I guess you want to 
keep the foil high, but not too, like I, I, when I started tacking, I noticed I over foiled a lot. I, I would breach, I would go into it like too fast, too high. And then I would focus on the wing and I would just breach because I was kind of going too fast. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, just be comfortable in the foil. And uh, if you're comfortable breaching the tip of your wing and turns just a little bit, that that'll help a lot because generally uh, if you come into attack that the tip's going to come out a little bit mm -hmm. um i don't know just, just being comfortable in foil uh be comfortable with your drives be, com be comfortable with your wing handling um and you should get it pretty fast yeah well especially the the front side tacks i find pretty easy but the kind of going backside is a little bit more tricky like when you have to throw mm -hmm. it behind you kind of like grab it yeah yeah yeah, and then for the more advanced riders, if you want to get a better acceleration out of your tack, as as you come through the wind and slow down, use progressively more back foot pressure. Um, if you come up, when you get back on the power, you want to be as high on the mass as possible, because then you can accelerate down the mass and and use yeah your gravitational potential energy. That's a good pointer. I, I've noticed too, like when, when I kick out of a wave and attack, you know, kicking out, like once mm -hmm. I get over the tip of the wave, I actually point my nose down and I kind of push yeah. down the backside and then you get a little bit of speed coming off the back of the wave. And yeah. if you don't do that, you can end, end up easily breaching because your foil will come up too high. Uh, mm -hmm. and as you're kicking out. Yeah. So, I mean, that same thing as when you're yeah. and kicking out, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. About also about the wing size of jumping. I've I've jumped some really big wings and some and some really small wings, and it seems like a three five is a pretty good balance or four meter. Um, because I notice on the big wings, I can't get enough speed. There's too much drag on it, mm -hmm. um, and I can't get enough speed for a, a, a good high pop. Depends on the, on your foil too, but uh, and on on too small of a wing, you just come down super hard, and it doesn't have the the power to rip you up. Um, also foil dependent, like the dispensers foils must be, have, I think they have crazy pop. Um, and so do, so do Kai's new stuff. Kai's new foils have insane pop. And that, that really helps you in that initial acceleration. Yeah. The foil matters a lot. And then, I mean, I've actually gotten some of my biggest jumps on a five, eight, you know, like a really big wing in relatively okay. light wind, but it's being so that powered too. up. And the thing is, it's like a, parachute pulling me up like it's almost like kite surfing i guess and and then you can just yeah. get a lot of hang time too because you got that big canopy over you and just like landing that's softly. true i'm i'm used to jumping in a lot of wind over here right um, so yeah. definitely a, a medium a wind. wing but in, in light wind yeah i can Great. see the tree outside your window it looks like the uh, wind's kind of coming up huh it's getting good today be a Hopefully, good afternoon today <laughs> yeah it, it it looks pretty glassy on the north shore um yeah. Can you see the water? But I can see the water from here. Nice, um, nice. But I think it'll come up enough. Should be a should be a fun day of foiling. So um, I I talked to Annie Riker too, and I guess you you guys go out together sometimes, or you get, you foil wing foil together. Or? Yeah, I I see her all the time at Sugar Cove. Um, she's she's down there a lot. So Kai and the Spencers. Um, yeah. It's she's pretty, pretty cool. amazing i have to say for you know she, the stuff she does is pretty impressive yeah no that that whole area too and it, it is crazy it's just unbelievable for progression um being around that good of riders and and seeing inspiration from every, what everybody else is doing is, is pretty special so who else do you think would be good to interview for this show? And I get, you know, in particular, I mean, I'm trying to stick with wing people that wing foil and can share some experience on wing foiling, especially, you know? Yeah. Um, you've done Alan Cadiz, who, who um, maybe Damien Girardin, who does, they did the wing rise wings and a few designer, others yeah. would be good designer. Um, he's a lot, he's had a lot of experience designing wings and kites and, um, he'd be good. Ooh. Um, all the kids are great. Um, yeah, it's tricky. I always recommend I like I always it recommend is, uh, to interview Mark Rappahorst. So, and, and you, Oh yeah. Mark would be, Mark would be good too. Um, yeah. he's an interesting guy and, and has, has had so much experience building boards. 
Yeah, he's a funny um, guy too. <laughs> he, yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna try to great. get him on the show for sure. Um, I know it's more wing swelling centered, but but Dave Kalama is, is an amazing guest. Yeah, I'd love um, to have him on the show too. Yeah, yeah, and he has, has he, some really have insightful you seen, things to say. Have you seen Dave Kalama wing foiling at all? Has he done tried it or not really? Not really. Actually, Alex Aguero might be interesting. Um, oh, he's, yeah, he's been obsessed with going real and like breaking his own speed records. Um, I actually saw him leaving for a down. I, we, I was leaving for a downwinder with with a few guys yesterday, and I, we saw him out of Malaya pumping up his wing <laughs> with his with his high speed front wing and going to go do some speed runs over there. Uh, pretty amazing, going really fast. Yeah, I'd love to talk to Alex too. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yep. All right. So another question I always ask everybody is, um, you know. During the pandemic, a lot of people are struggling, either feeling lonely or depressed or anxious mm -hmm. and so on. So what do you do when you have a bad day or like how you know, you have any kind of pointers to keep your positive outlook and, and stay happy? For me, uh, lucky, when lucky we live Hawaii, I was able to get in the water pretty much every day. Um, and that's, that's the biggest thing for me. It's just, just getting out in nature uh, getting some exercise every day, uh, makes, makes a huge difference. And, uh, yeah, just, just having a passion you can follow, um, helped me a lot. That's a good answer. Yeah. It's like, yeah, getting on the water is kind of like therapy, right? If you, if you're yeah. feeling, feeling down, yeah, it's hard to, hard not to be happy when you're, when you're on the water. Right. And Maui, especially, and, and winging even more is, is uh, winging on Maui is, is a fairly safe, covid wise thing to do um you're you're out in the open in 25 knots of wind um in the water and and you know you can see these people you can you can make friends at the beach and see these people every day and, and uh, yeah it's, it's been awesome actually yeah let's talk a little bit about the pandemic i know like in the paper it said recently that there was there's a church on maui like that had like a covid outbreak and they still wanted to have their easter um service and whatever so how do you yeah. feel about that whole thing it's tricky over here but uh and we, we've been having a lot of cases recently but uh, the, on the on the upside i i see i hear about and see and meet more and more people every day that have been getting vaccinated um especially locals and and that makes that'll make a big difference as far as just people's overall comfort and and helping control it um, yeah, and yeah. the other thing I, that, that seems like a big problem, it's hard to get actual, actual numbers or information on it, but, um, uh, walking around tourist areas is, is pretty, uh, pretty shocking. There's, there's a ton of people. Like I, I went to Lahaina recently or, or Kanapali and there's a lot of people just not really, not really minding, uh, while I'm on vacation do whatever yeah um, i just got my second shot yesterday so um oh nice yeah i get my second shot on the 12th oh nice so cool yeah, yeah i mean we're lucky in hawaii that that or you know and i guess in the u.s that um mm -hmm. we're able to get vaccines a lot of places in the world don't don't even have a lot of vaccines totally yet, so and hawaii has been doing really well i heard i heard la is doing amazing they have like 200 cases a day yeah just in LA, which compared to Hawaii is, is such a low percentage for the population. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, California right now is actually pretty low. Um, but they, I mean, there's a, other spots in the country that are still really bad. And then Super high. in Europe, yeah. they have an, another outbreak too. So, and then those new, mm -hmm. the new strains are kind of, uh, nasty too. more. They spread. Yeah. More easily. Well, yeah. I just I just read an article. You might find that interesting too. In the Economist, it was talking about um, bees. You know, honeybees. They mm -hmm. actually vaccinate their babies. Like the the queen bee gets really. Like, yeah, they just had some research. I guess the 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 worker bees feed the queen bee like this royal jelly, and and that contains mm -hmm. like some some virus particle, protein particles, and then wow. they kind of make their own vaccine that they kind of inject into the 
into the baby bees or something. I don't, I don't know, but it's pretty cool. So they yeah. have like the original vaccine vaccinations program. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I love, the, the great thing about the, the, the this vaccine in particular is just the, the huge jump in, in technology it, it created. Yeah. Um, and so much money was put into it and, and so much effort that it's affecting it. It's affecting other things too. So I think I, I just saw they're they're developing a way better HIV vaccine, and and uh, ooh, I forget what it was. They're using they're using some part of a recent development to uh, prevent you from having to inject insulin, so you could take it as a pill. Hmm. So things like that are are amazing, and I'm I'm definitely a big believer in in putting money into into science and, and development because that's where the you can do amazing things when with enough funding. So, I mean, earlier you touched kind of that you're pretty happy right now doing what you're doing, kind of being a designer and being um, going on the water every day and doing both together, which I think is awesome. You know, and I don't, I don't yeah. see a reason why you shouldn't just do that and and why why go to school if you're having fun. But if you went to school, what what would be the um, the university you, you would pick? I'm not sure yet. Um... I, I didn't like, I didn't like school that much. Uh, I didn't do great in school and I spent most of the time thinking about <laughs> boats and, and, and kiting and surfing. So, right. uh, it, yeah, it, I'd have to find a, a school that would, that would fit me really well in that way. Um, I definitely thought about, I have a dual citizenship with the Netherlands because my dad, my dad was born there. Oh, nice. um, so I could go study in Europe for an EU, an EU price. Which is basically Definitely free. You don't have attractive to attractive option. University. Yeah, right. Yeah. You can go somewhere and I can live there and I, I'm a citizen. So nice. Yeah. It's, it's do, you speak, uh, do you speak Dutch? I, I, I understand it better than I speak it. Yeah. Um, I and it definitely that. helps my understanding when I'm there. Uh, if I if I spend two weeks in Europe then then I'm kind of caught caught back up and I can I can order food and, and understand most conversation. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely cool. That would be a good experience too to live in Europe for a while. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I guess you can not still, right now though. You can still wing foil. Yeah, not right now, but you, I guess you could still wing foil. It just kind of gets freezing cold in the winter. So we're definitely pretty lucky here in Hawaii that we yeah. can go out every day of the year without freezing our ass off. Right? <laughs> Man, right, right where my my grandparents live in this, in, this, in a small town on the Eiffelmeer in uh, in Holland. And well, the the downwinding, sea. yeah, North Sea. Mm -hmm. the, the downwinding there would be absolutely like unbelievable. Yeah, um, like gorge, gorge, gorge level. Yeah, um, they get a lot of wind. Could go, you could go for a hundred miles down the coast, <laughs> and yeah, it's, yeah, it's awesome, pretty epic. So one one day, cross my fingers, I get to I get to go for a downwinder there. Yeah. I mean, I, I love Holland. Like, like Amsterdam is such a cool city. If you could live there for a while, it'd probably be a good, good experience. It's like, yeah, they're kind of ahead of the rest of the world with everything. Like, drug, yeah, it's pretty drug, cool. Uh, legalization, or, or you know, just being tolerant of things like gay marriage and all that stuff. They they were kind yeah. of the first on everything, you know. One of the, and one of their big exports is just technology. So they they definitely have a good thing going. Uh -huh. I checked out like Delft University and they actually, when I was over in Holland last time, they, they had a student design competition for solar uh, electric power, electric foiling boats. Wow. And so they were, they were doing all these, all these different races with their, with their foiling boats. It's pretty cool. I actually, I saw on, on your um, Instagram feed on the bottom, there was like some kind of weird uh, design that you made. What, what, what is that one? Let me, let me go back to that. Um, it looked like you built some kind of model or something here, this thing. What is that? Uh, let's see. Did you build that? Oh, yeah. Um, that, was an old, that was an old drone I, I broke and uh, put it on a little skateboard. And, and I don't know, made a, made a car out of it. it fun. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Did it work? It worked. It worked fun. It worked great, actually. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I thought of I thought of something interesting back then too. I 
I would crash my gliders, right, and, and break the fuselage apart and have all these extra wings. And so I thought, well, what if you just connected the wings at the center, right, and put them on a big, like an A-frame with a pivot point at the top and had your wing pivot back and forth as a sail, right? So when you tack, the wing would do this and it would do that. And you could use, you could use an airplane wing for it. Wait, wait, I, 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 I didn't really catch that. Okay. Explain it again. So this, this is your airplane wing, right? Okay. And you have, you have a boat or, or a car or something, something that can move. Um, if, you, if you take your airplane wing and put it on a pivot point up here, mm -hmm. it would pivot and you could, you could run that way or it would pivot and run the other way. Okay. Um, I thought of using my airplane wings for that. Turns out it's a lot like winging <laughs> Yeah, and I, I recently I've been thinking, well, maybe I could maybe I could build a, 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 a like an airplane wing and use it for winging something yeah. solid, like a solid wing. That would probably be the fastest. I mean, if you it would be so fast. If you just want speed, then obviously a rigid. I mean, the, the inflatable wings are really aerodynamically not very efficient, right? Because they're so fast. they're really bad. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's totally some improvement that can be made if, uh, on a racing side. Uh, I I don't think it needs to happen because it yeah. would be it would be bad from the accessibility side, the ease of use side, and I, that's probably the most important part of the sport is making sure everybody can do it and everybody can have have a good competitive fun time. Um, so that's where the, the current design is. They really excel. Right, just the ease of use and all, all that. Easy to use, easy to transport. Could it, it, you know, you, you can perform at a really, still perform at a really high level with it. Um, I mean, look at, yeah, look at the jumps people are doing. T. Tuan and, and the Spencers and Kai and uh, Balls Mueller, yeah. Rediculo on Instagram. He's unbelievable. Yeah, he does some crazy stuff. So, I mean, what, what are some moves that you're currently working on? Or like, um, do you have anything that you're trying to do that you're not quite? Yeah, there? getting, getting, getting better at 360s uh, with the wing and then going into some flips. Like 360s that's, that's in what the what I'm working on right like now. Like kind of spinning with the wing. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so, yeah. I've been, like I've been, I've been trying those too and I've been like, you're basically turning the board into the wind and then bringing the wing around. Mm -hmm. I Like what's this, what's the secret? I, I've, I always struggle on the landing. I, I, I'm having a hard time pulling those off. What worked best for me was First of all, not not pointing super high up wind before you do it. So bear off a little bit. Maybe okay. start at a reach. Um, practice in light wind, and don't use a super short mast. So probably an eighty centimeter mast would be good, or more would be good for it. Um, make sure you can do a three sixty in the surf off the back of a wave. Um, so if you if you have surf foil, just pump out, get your three sixty down off the back of a wave. Um, and then for, for the wing part of it, it's tricky. What I like to do is jump and basically shove the wing back as I'm, as I'm rotating and then bring it over my head as I come around. But that, that first initial rotation where your body rotates before the wing uh, will make a big difference. Okay. Yeah. It's like you turn the board before the rest of the body kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I'm starting to... I, I want to do a more and more like like tweaked out. So instead of just a flat 360, I want to do like a like a more backflipy 360. Down. I mean, yeah, like the the ones Balz Muller does those backflips where he kind of goes up and then he flips the wing and then he yeah, comes around with the rest of the body and that that looks super cool too. But I'm just not brave enough to try that yet. <laughs> I think yeah, the biggest obstacle for me was commitment because it's way more intimidating before you do it than than after you do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just, Actually, just the commitment to... of, of Sorry, pointing the wrong way and doing the 360 is, is way scarier than, than the crashes. Um, so, so what I like to do is, is go into one and just you just have to like get in your head and be like, okay, this crash isn't going to hurt. Like you, you're, you're, realistically, you're going to be totally fine. And you do one and you crash. You do another and you crash um, and get used to crashing. All right. 
Um, yeah. And then once, once you do that, you're comfortable sending it harder and harder into, into different rotations. Which video is it where you're doing a 360 on a prone board? Do you know, is it this one or this one? Or like, I was going to ask board. you, like you're doing like 360s on the wave with the prone board. Oh, like a carving. Yeah. Carving 360. 360. Let's talk about you doing the three. 360s on the wave kind of walk us through that move a little bit yeah um the first few times i had a lot of trouble what would happen is i'd pump way out in front of the wave and it felt like no matter how how far i pumped in front of the wave i couldn't make it back around in time um and i i tried that forever and could could never do it but the trick that that helped a lot was to pump out in front of the wave and then wait like a second where you, where you just stop pumping for a second when you're way out ahead. And that'll slow you down enough that when you do the, the spin, you, you don't, uh, you can actually make a tight enough turn for the wave. The other thing is you don't need to lean over super hard. If you, if you do that one second wait, um, you just do a normal bottom turn and it, it, it kind of works out. Interesting. I think, I think Clinton Yap had some, I think it's Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. He, he does it on the stand up and uh, doing it. I've watched watch, that. watch how he pumps to the bottom and then wait. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, like what I, this is just a question out of curiosity, like how much of your skills would you say are, do, are from like pure talent and like natural ability and how much is from just hard work and repetition and, and, and keep trying, trying and practicing. I don't really like to believe that you like a natural talent, but I credit a lot of my skills to knowing what's going on with the flow. Um, uh, I, I like the first few times I tried the first, what I, what I thought is like, Oh, this is just like flying, flying a plane. I'm, I'm flying a plane underwater. And further from that knowing what how the foil works and and how it how it'll do it what it'll do in different situations helps understand uh what i'll feel when i when i put it in those situations so you know like oh what happens when i put it in the foam or how does my board re redirect water or or just really paying attention to yeah what you're what you feel and, and what's happening with your, with your gear uh, when you do those things. Uh, so mental another thing, also, I mean, it's, so it's, it's not just talent and practice. It's also like understanding how it works and mentally and basically and visualizing it basic or another thing that helps everybody, uh, obviously time on the water. I've, I've, I've had so much time on the water, but um, watching video of yourself, anyone, no matter how good you are or, or how new you are to the sport, Getting someone to take a video of you and watching that and either either having someone who's better than you look at it and tell you what they think or or just comparing it to videos of of, of people who who are good at it. Um, and and just pay pay attention to what they do with their body, what what they do with their head. Um, yeah, mostly body positioning. Uh, that'll make a big difference. I, so emulating other other people's like they can yeah. already do the move you're trying right yeah that, that's a good one we, we yeah. were talking before the interview too and and i thought that was really interesting you said that if you listen to a podcast or listen to the mm -hmm. conversation like this that we're having then on the way to the beach and then you go out and and you just kind of in the right state of mind already right so can you yeah talk about that? um I'm, I, I always get super stoked <laughs> uh, either. Like if, if I meet someone, sometimes, sometimes I'll talk to someone who, who's, who's like a, a aeronautical engineer or something. And, and then after that, you're so psyched and, and in such a good mindset to go foil. Um, or, or you listen to a, a great podcast or, or, or long form video and it, it puts you in that analytical headspace where when you foil, you, you, you can pay attention to exactly what you're doing. And, 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 and as you're doing it, you kind of think about well, what's my body doing, what's my foil doing, how's my setup feel. Um, and it definitely helps with your focus.
Um, I think yeah. one thing I, I, one of my goals for, for every, every move, every way is, is simplify it in my head as much as I can. The, the less I think and the more it goes on subconsciously, um, the better I arrive. So I try and boil everything down to, to where I look. Um, you get everything subcon controlled in your subconscious. So uh, when you when you want to do something, you just look in, in certain places, and it happens. Um, so like a cutback, instead of thinking about what my instead of actively thinking about everything, I just look back and train your body to to do everything it needs, um, because that frees up a lot of headspace for for learning new tricks, or or it frees up a lot of mental space for for quick reactions to things. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I think we all know that feeling when, that you get when everything just kind of works out perfectly and yeah. you're just in sync. So how, like, how would you describe that? Like the perfect mindset and, and where everything kind of just meshes together in your body and mind just kind of work together perfectly and stuff and end with nature, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, that definitely lines up with the, the less going on in my head. So Sometimes you, you just that, get in the right. You were just saying like you try to analyze it and stuff like that, but in a way, but you analyze it, kind it of can be counterproductive, right? Yeah, <laughs> you don't analyze it in the moment. That's the important right. thing. Yeah. You got to analyze it before and after. Yeah, um, I think so. And, and, and yeah, the, the more it, when you're doing it, you just have to let it happen, right? Or something. Yeah, I don't know. Right, yeah. And that's why uh, I I also cut a big part of everything I do to just having a really well tuned setup. If your setup is well tuned, you don't have to think about compensating for it, and it doesn't do anything unexpected, um, and that that helps you get in that that kind of flow state of yeah of, of where everything just lines up and, and works perfectly. Yeah, I love that. So um, that's another thing I want to ask you because you you obviously try a lot of different gear and change things around and test different things, but. Um, you know, the, the flip side of that, you know, to me, if I have a setup that works, I just like mm -hmm. to just use it exactly the way I used it last time. Don't change yeah. anything and then just know how it feels. And then right away, I can get into that flow, right? Versus mm -hmm. when you're trying something new, then you always have to spend some time learning it, figuring it out. And, and it, you know, like after a while, if you're using the same setup over and over, then it becomes almost like part of your, your, yeah, totally. System, man. That's part of, uh, oh, how do I explain it? Um, <clears throat> I, I try and do it a lot. I try and change my setups, even when the waves are really good. Um, if, if, if you ride one setup for too long, you kind of, it, I, I feel myself kind of losing perspective on how it works in the general world of things. So, by changing things up a lot, uh, I, I'm, or, or, or trying a lot of different gear, I, it kind of gives me a, a good reference of how other things work. And it's important that you, that you try new stuff when the conditions are good, as well as when the conditions are bad. It's easy to, it's easy to say, oh, the, the wind sucks today. I might as well just try, try my different tailing or, or move the mass. But when it's epic, it's hard to do that. Um, and, and also if you don't have much time because you don't want to have to come back in to change yep. track or something like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So that's, for example, toe foil. I, I, I toe foiled a few times and that's just such a good way to dial in your gear because you can, you bring, you bring your tail wings and your tools and your whatever, everything on, on the ski in epic conditions, you get so many waves that you, you have your fill. And I usually start with, trying the most I, I try the most experimental stuff first um i try the stuff that doesn't work first and then i figure oh this doesn't work if i if, if i'm not fresh and it, it doesn't feel good fresh it, it's not going to work um then slowly you change and i always try and end my session with something that does work really well because that that puts you in that positive that positive kind of thinking where you're like oh that was such a good session versus uh, ending on ending on something that doesn't work kind of kind of ruins it. 
Yeah, I mean, actually, actually, that's always what what I I always try to end every session with like a good wave or a good move. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. You don't you don't want to like if you just crash and you're like, oh, I'm gonna go in. It's like no, I gotta do at least one good wave or one good move. Yeah. Or before I go in, and then once you do it, you just once you do that good move, you have to cut your losses there and just go in. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> like okay, look, I can't. That this top set, I'm not gonna do anything better. Yeah, no, that um, that's exactly that's always a, the best way to leave the water. Then you can't wait to get out again the next time, right? Yeah. But yeah, and especially as a as a as a designer, trying setups that other people like is important, mm. and trying new gear from other manufacturers is important, and it all it all gives you a good idea of where the sport's moving and what people are happy on and. And uh, what you, uh, you could possibly improve on? Yeah, um, I, I have a question about that actually. So, has have you tried something that you thought, like in theory, this is not really going to work? I don't think this is going to be good. But then you got on it, and you were surprised. It's like, oh, this is actually has merit. Like, has, have you had anything like that? Any experiences like that? Hmm. I would say these current this my current surf wing. I kind of like that. Uh, I I just like the profile I used on them. I was like, let's just try it. Let's just see what happens, right? So because it's totally it again, against the one you showed earlier. Yeah, yeah. This one, the, okay. the airfoil, it's super went totally against what I thought would work well. And same with same with the new tailings I tried, but it, it ended up working amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm super happy with it and definitely definitely gives you like a wake up moment of oh i should i shouldn't be safe all the time and, and you should try new things and, and uh, like I, I really like for example what armstrong just did with their with their swept back tail super super different design and it looks like they they executed it really well um and i've heard it works insane right and i can't yeah. wait to try one <laughs> Yeah, Rob Rob Whittle was saying they they put it through the um through the America's Cup. Yeah, that's un, that's unfair. <laughs> that's a fair, unfair <laughs> advantage. But you know, like the America's Cup foils on those on those monohull boards, they mm -hmm. um, or boats, they actually look surprisingly similar to what kind of the shapes that we're using for surfing, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's interesting too because similar to surf foils, they're dealing with breaching the tips. Mm, and yeah. what are they using? They're using they're using winglets. Upturned um, winglets, yeah. Upturned winglets. And it probably makes it way more forgiving. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'd love to talk to, to, to some of those foil designers. Because yeah. That would be fascinating. I mean, reaching sure. on one of those big boats is a whole different... <laughs> yeah, that's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, they definitely use different, different foil sections, but like the general... Yeah, it's generally a, a similar shape should work they're they're definitely doing some interesting things with like flex they've got to be using flex in crazy ways on those big wings right yeah um yeah it would be interesting to to get some uh, perspectives on their their design ideas but it's probably all top secret oh yeah guaranteed they're not they probably have non-disclosure agreements there <laughs> but, um, but yeah no i'm i'm super keen on trying all that new Armstrong gear because their, their high aspect looks sick. Mm -hmm. If I had to guess, I would guess that is the most efficient foil on the market right now. That, um, the 1125 high aspect, it's like yeah. 9.8 9 to one aspect ratio. We're, we're getting some of Yeah, it's like a hundred, 105 centimeter span. Ridiculous. So um, I actually had a question, the aspect ratio, is it just the, um, the ratio between the width and the, the, like, that divided by that or is it like what is what does it's it actually the ratio do? of the width to the area um oh the width to the area okay yeah uh so the the way you calculate it is wingspan squared divided by uh area oh uh, okay so for example yeah 100 centimeters squared and then you divide it by area and you get your you get your uh, you get your aspect ratio okay 
Cool. Well, um, I really appreciate your time. We spent over two hours already. So any, yeah. anything else you want to leave people with? I, I mean, I, I think everybody's going to love this interview. It's, it's awesome. We get talked about some really cool, interesting stuff, I think. Yeah. Um, check for more general information. Check out the, my, my Shopify. I've been trying, I've been working on some blog posts there. Um, and I just, I just want to post a bunch of just general foil information, tips like we talked about for winging, tips for learning. Um, you know, go go maybe a little more in depth into design, and and uh, I, I I want to do some reviews on just gear I like. Um, I think that that would be helpful because not every it, you know I'm I'm on all I'm on all custom gear, but for everybody else, you know well, what what gear works good what what gear do i like so i think i think it'll it'll be cool posting yeah. who are the people that support you the most like who do you want to thank for supporting you and so on definitely mark Rappers, uh damian gerard and dennis parton from who, who does my cnc and, and finishing on the tails um, they've been amazing uh yeah shout out to all those guys and shout out to everybody on Maui just pushing it and keeping the, keeping the vibe positive and um, everybody's stoked and, and it's a good environment. Awesome. All right, Kane. Well, thanks so much. And uh, maybe in a, in a year or so, I'll try to get you back on the show so you can share your latest, yeah. latest stuff that you're working on. And stuff like that. So, <laughs> I'd love and to. I, I really appreciate that you shared all your stuff on your computer and stuff. I, I think a lot of people would have been more secretive about that. So super cool. Yeah. And, the whole spirit of this sport and sharing and, and enjoying it together. That's super cool. I think. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah. Um, All right, Kane. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Congratulations. You made it to the very end of the interview. And like I said before, if you're still listening now, this show is for you. You're part of a very elite group of about 5% of the people that actually watch the whole thing. So congratulations. You are as crazy about wing foiling as I am. And I hope you enjoyed every minute of it as much as I did. I think I could have kept on going forever. And I actually did, we did keep on going a little bit. So if you're interested in printing 3D shims for your foils or designing your own foils and the programs that Kane uses and so on, uh, it's super cool how, how much he shared here. He didn't really hold back anything. So thank you again, Kane, for being so open and sharing. I really appreciate that. This show is made possible by Blue Planet customers that support our business and make it possible for me to make shows like this. And I want to say a special thanks to customers who ordered the PPC wings over the last week since I posted that review last weekend. And two weeks ago, I posted the interview with Sam Loader, the designer of the PPC wings. So I just want to give a special shout out to those customers who ordered the PPC wings last week. You made this show possible. You're the sponsors of the show. So thank you, Matt and James from Hawaii, Brooke and Dominique from California, Mario from Germany, and everyone else who supports our business. And if you're not already a Blue Planet customer, next time you're ready to buy some equipment, please consider us. And I think you'll find we have excellent equipment, great service, and fair prices. Please check out blueplanetsurf.com and support the Blue Planet show. So at the end of these interviews, I'm gonna always try to have a special message for those of you who are still watching, the five percenters out there. And uh, basically today my message is, please remember to have fun, share the experience, help others, be safe, and in be inclusive. So let's keep the sport fun and enjoyable for everyone. So thanks for watching. Please give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. The videos are always ad free for the first week, so get to watch them right away when we post a new video by subscribing and clicking on that little bell icon so you get notified when a new video gets posted. And keep watching, because there's some more bonus material coming after the outro. Thanks again for watching, see you on the water, aloha.
you look at the, at the SHIB section, there should be a, a, a download link to like a Google Drive of a bunch of STL, STL files. This is for if anybody wants to design their own their own tails. Um, I try like I think I have the MSC connection on there. I have the Armstrong tail connection on there. Um, this should be compatible with A plus. Uh, and I I try and keep everything relatively open because I don't see why uh, like it, it's all it's all uh, public stuff. If you if you go and, and look one, you can measure it. So um, I like I like helping anyone out who's who's looking into designing their own gear. That's super yeah. cool. I mean, w- would you be uh, able to coach someone? Like, if I wanted to learn how to do this kind of stuff, would you be able to do like private coaching on how to use the three D software and stuff like that? Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> and I could definitely direct you to some to some good online resources for it too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that. I'll try to make that part of my part of my site and and give a lot of good information on foil design um, and, and choosing different designs and what they do better or worse. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty good. So at, people have the information. I'm pretty good at using Shape 3D to design boards, and I guess mm-hmm. they made them. You're able to design foils on there too. I just haven't really played around with it yet. What what Actually, software do you use? Shout- I, I use uh, mostly XFLR5, which is a it's plain, uh, whatever, analysis and uh-huh. kind of design program. And I use like uh, Rhino 7 for, for surfacing and for actually creating the, the models. Hmm. But one program that I really like, it's called Finfoil. Uh, hmm. And it's this guy I met through Instagram who, who had a, you can, there's, there's an applet on the website that you can use, but he made he made a program uh, or a website that lets you design fins really easily for windsurf fins, and they have all that you can export in all these different file types. Um, and he just has been updating it for foil design, and actually, it for just designing wings aside from connections and everything, it might be the best foil design software out there. Um, because you can export it into X, XFLR5, which is the analysis, pro, which is an analysis program. You can export it into SolidWorks STL for 3D printing. You can do a whole lot with it. Um, and he's a smart guy. He's a super That's super cool. Guy. So definitely check out, yeah, Finfoil. That's a good tip. Appreciate that. Any any other cool stuff you want to share? <laughs> that? Um, super interesting. Ooh, cool stuff. Cool stuff. Yeah, tinfoil is great. Uh, anyone looking oh, for like it? for the for the you know cutting out like the, those G10. You said um, Dennis. Um, Dennis Pardon. Yeah, Tectonic he, Maui. Um, he used to yeah, work like Hawaii. Um, what is it? What was it called? Hawaiian Winter. Promax. Hmm? I think oh, he was Promax. Promax. Oh, yeah. yeah, like way back in the day, windsurfing. Yeah, so um, so he has like a CNC machine, and he cuts out the G10 foils for you. He has he has a, few, uh, a couple CNC and CNC machines, and uh, yeah, I send him. To, I do the design and testing, and he does the he does the actual construction of it. So, tons of credit to him because these definitely wouldn't be what they are without his insane perfectionism. Do, do you have to hand finish it or is it, does it come out of the machine almost? No, he, he hand finishes it. Mm. Um, and that's what makes a big difference. It's just the hand f- finishing on it is perfect. Mm. Um, whatever, yeah. whatever I design in the file down to the, down to like a hundredth of a millimeter, you can see in, uh, in, in the finished product. Yeah. You know, I, my, the first wing I designed and, and prototype, it was like kind of a real thick beginner foil, basically mm-hmm. easy foiler. And the, the sample I got that was uh, G10 fiberglass, it was like, it probably weighed like 30 Drop. pounds, you know, the front wing. Oh. And, and I, well, maybe not that much, but it was super heavy and just get, getting it yeah. into the water is really hard. And I thought no, this thing is not going to work. It's just too heavy, you know, but then flying at the first time i was like blown away it felt so smooth and steady and yeah. like it was just really nice in the water and it wasn't really a disadvantage like how does it do you, have you had that kind of experience with those real heavy um wings yeah well one thing this material is it, i really like because it's super consistent um and plus with cnc machining like 
every tailwind you get is going to feel exactly the same. There's no differences due to layoffs or they're all the same strength. They will all flex the same. They're all exactly the same shape. Um, and I've been riding heavy, heavy gear for, for a while, actually. Like this setup is pretty heavy. It's an aluminum fuselage and a solid G10 front wing. Mm-hmm. Uh, like for example, my 800 front wing weighs one point, almost 1.2 kilos, just the, just the wing. And so it's like probably more front than wing twice as a, heavy as like say an Armstrong oh, yeah. boiler setup or something like that. But yeah, so my how does down, that... my downwind front wing is a beast. Uh, so how does that? And I don't really notice it. So in the it water, seem to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, unless you're doing only big airs or something like that, right? Oh, I'm also doing pretty big. I've been doing pretty big airs on it, and it, mm. it's fine. Uh, strapless airs, different story. <laughs> and maybe like crazy rotations, probably different story. But uh, but for for most of your riding, it really doesn't make a big, make a difference at all. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then what about the compa- comparing aluminum mass to carbon mass, like and different? Um, I guess. I like the feel of carbon masks more because, uh, especially tapered design, tapered carbon masks are great. You can, because the, the flex, where the flex is really important is near the base plate. Uh, and on a carbon mask, you can have that thick and have the bottom still thin for low drag. Uh, it's, it's a nice reactive feel. Aluminum masks are great though. The, the, the Nash aluminum mask is pretty impressive because it's reasonably stiff, but it's insanely light. Um, and even, I mean, I've, I've rode the, the Axis aluminum mass a ton. Mm-hmm. don't have a problem with it. Right. Especially for towing. If, if you're not in the air, like, you can ride such a heavy setup. And it, it, it works just fine. Yeah, I think for towing, actually, it's helpful to have a little bit heavier gear. I mean, especially the board. Yeah. You to have a little bit more weight in the board and the foil, I think, actually. Yeah. Um, and, like, you know, smaller surfing, pumping. Uh, as long as your board's light, if your your board actually not even your board doesn't even have to be light. As long as the nose and tail are light, you're you're pretty set. Mostly about um, low swing weight in the board. Yeah, yeah. swinging the, swinging a big heavy board around will will take more, way more energy than a, than a big heavy foil. Yeah, um, and that'll make the biggest difference to your riding hands down. Interesting. Okay. Good. To yeah. Know. The board, the board makes a bigger difference than a lot of people realize. Uh, yeah. Especially weight, shape. You can ride anything once you're in the air. Yeah, like that uh, little body uh, board you yeah. were riding. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. That, that wasn't fun to touch down on. Cool. I think I'm gonna let you go now, so you can get in the water, do something fun. Yeah, I gotta go shift some tails go. out. So. Yeah. Awesome, Kate. Thanks so much. Take care. Have a yeah, great no problem. Day. You talk too. To you later.